Hello, hello. Welcome back. I'm seeing some familiar faces as well. So, uh, yeah, welcome back. Uh, it's my delight to introduce uh, Doctor, isn't it, right? Dr. Ashley Aitken. Ashley Aitken has a passion for helping businesses create value with IT, helping startups find successful business models, and all things related to AI, minds, and brains. Today, he's going to explain what it means to say we are all computers and the implications this may have for building conscious machines. Buckle up. It's going to be a wild ride. Here's Ashley. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Um, as you said, my talk today, I'm a computer, and so are you. And my goal here is really trying to, to convince you of the validity of this statement. Okay? But after we've done that, we'll have a look at some more bigger questions, which I don't have the answer to, but I think you might find uh, interesting as well. So I'm a computer, uh, and so are you. Let's go on. Um, this all started uh, many years ago when I was doing a PhD in AI. And I was trying to make computers work more like humans, be more able to match the world and, and, and work in a fuzzy world and a wishing world. But after doing my PhD for a number of years, I realized really it wasn't about that. It came back to me thinking that computers are actually more like, oh, sorry, the brain is more, actually more like computers. And this really shocked me. I'd gone a total flip of what I'm doing. That's what I want to try and explain to you today. But just to be clear up front, when I say a brain is more like a computer, I don't mean a von Neumann type architecture, von Neumann type architecture with a CPU and RAM. Of course, we're not like that. Um, and one of the things I want to talk about today is what actually it is it to be a computer. Uh, I did uh, computer science for many years. I worked as an academic in computer science for many years. And I'll tell you that 95% of people in that domain probably don't know what it means to be a computer. It's something you program for sure, but what does it mean to be a computer? That's what we'd be talking about as well. So here's the sort of overview of the story for my uh, talk. The first big question is, what are computers? To get you to understand that question. The second one is, what am I? And by contrast, you, because you're similar to me, hopefully. And then last one, the big question there, what is I? That's the, the one which I may not be able to answer, but we'll get a, a good start on it, I think. Um, a bit of background about myself. I work as an IT consultant for a company called Business Aspect, a parent company, data number three. I have a background in AI, cognitive science, and neuroscience. But I think of myself as a software developer and an IT person and a computer scientist. I have a big focus on innovation consulting. I like to help, as I think Hannah said, startups, but also organizations in any sector, uh, any stage of maturity, including startups, to find new businesses. If the old businesses are going away, to find a new one. And we do that using an exploration metaphor. Uh, I also run the Lean Startup Perth Meetup. Um, and I have a number of, number of startups myself. The current one, which is just about to go live soon, is called Lean Explorers Club. Um, so please look out for that. OK, so also thanks to our sponsors and the volunteers who run this uh, conference. Uh, particularly, I met some at the ca speech at Catch-Up Night, Insight, and Versant, and Planet. So thanks to them. But thanks to all the sponsors who helped this, uh, make this event possible. OK, um, in this same room uh, a couple of years ago, I gave a talk on functional programming. And my goal there was to make everyone's mind explode, blow, blow their brains with, uh, or it was quantum computers, sorry, blow their minds with quantum computers. Uh, last year, I tried to help people become anti-fragile. And when you lose your head, to grow back two new ones to replace that one head. This year, I'm taking a bit of a different tack. Uh, as I mentioned in the brief, I'm going to be um, trying out some pain. OK, so experience some, some pain, but also try in some mind-altering experiences here, trying to get you to think differently about your mind. So let's see how we go with that. OK, so the first point here, what are computers? Think to yourself, what do I, what's, you know, it's a digital computer, I program it, but what do we mean when we talk about computers? This sort of thing, OK, a computer. What do we mean by that? Now, maybe if you've sort of got a computer science background or a technical background, you may think, oh, well, computers are equivalent to Turing machines, or they have a von Neumann architecture and so forth. There's something which is, runs like this. Or you may also think, you know, a computer, computability. Can I calculate something with this computer or compute something with an algorithm? You may think about algorithms. And you may think about, oh, yeah, well, computers do calculations, these sort of things. And these are all correct but they don't get to what the essence is of a computer. And that's what I want to try and to explain. Now, this slide has a lot of text, so it's the formal definition of things. But I'll just point out the key points to you, or read it out to you. 
It says a computational system is a physical system that allows three specific but more general levels of description above that of the physical level. And these three levels are what we call the functional level, the symbolic level, and the semantic level. You may have heard of those. And there are a couple extra requirements. The symbolic states in the, sim in the symbolic level, they refer to things. So when your computer has a symbol for a car, it's not actually the car inside the computer, it's a reference to that car. And the third one says that the symbols need to be consistent under transformations. That's the definition of a computational system. And I want to explain that to you so you can see what computers really are, and then we'll look at how the brain works. So of course the computer is a physical system. So any physical system, we can give a description in terms of the physical states, where the particles are, in which direction they're moving. And of course they obey the physical laws. So the particles are going to go around, ignoring quantum mechanics for now, they're going to move around like particles do and bump, bump into things and so forth. We can't break the physical laws, but we can change the configuration of the system to make it do things while still obeying those physical laws. So we have this physical level description. We start off in a physical state on the left, our initial state, we go to the next state according to the physical laws. The physical laws tell us how we go from one state to the next, and so on and so on. That's pretty obvious. But now what we said, one thing that a computational system allows is it allows a higher level description. We don't need to talk about the particles anymore. When you describe your computer, you don't say, well, these are particles here and particles moving there. When you describe a, a computer in the functional description, you describe it in terms of functional states and the functional specification or configuration of that system. These functional states are actually defined in terms of equivalent sets of physical states. And this is a really important concept. We're going to a higher level description, ignoring the difference in certain physical states, and we'll describe it that way. Let me show you in a picture. But first of all, first, before I show you that, we're looking at a very simplified model of computing and so forth here. We're just going to look at one input, gives us a direct output. And I'll explain the complexity later on. So we, on the left, we have the input state, and on the right, we have the output state. Um, input goes to output, very simple way to understand things. So let's have a look uh, at the next slide. Sorry, I lost my connection there. What is this functional description for a computer? Well, as I say, we ignore the position of the atoms and them moving around in the electrons, and we tend to describe the physical computer in terms of voltages. This memory chip, this memory cell, has a voltage of 0.2 volts, or this wire has a voltage. So this is another description of a computer above the physical level in terms of these voltages in the particular memory cells, for example. And of course, when you go from the input here, a 0.2 volt, you may go to another state, 0.9 volts. But again, that's just really an abstraction over the lower level states. Lots of different atoms running around in different directions could make equivalent to 0.9 volts. So the ones down the bottom are showing you there's a whole lot of equivalent physical states which correspond to 0.2 volts. And there's a whole lot of equivalent physical states which correspond to 0.9 volts. But we ignore that detail and just look at the top. So when the system actually goes from input to output, it could go from this physical state to that physical state inside the set, or it could do a different one, or it could do a different one. We don't really care about that detail. We just care at the functional level it goes from 0.2 volts to 0.9 volts. That's a functional description. Someone who's interested in electronics would probably look at that sort of description. That's the functional description of a computer. But where it gets interesting now is when we step up one level to this symbolic level description in symbolic states and rules. Here we have symbols which are referring to things and rules which how they describe how they change. So have a look again at our diagram. Now we think of this computer as a symbol system. We have a symbolic state, 0 or 1. And that 0 or 1 in memory cells could be anything less than 0 0.5 volts. So if it's 0 0.4 or 0 0.2 or 0 0.3, we don't care. We say it's a 0, a false or a 0 bit. And going from input to outputs, we can say, OK, we go from 0 to 1. There's a rule. If 0, then 1, because it's wired up in this way. We don't care whether the final state is 0.6 or 0.9. We ignore that detail and just say it goes from a 0 to 1. So now we're thinking about bits. 
We're working at a symbolic level in terms of symbolic states and the rules which say how they transfer or change. So this is the symbol level, and this is the level we sort of program computers at, and we'll get back to that. As I said, it doesn't matter the states below. We don't care about the details. Of course, it is going from one physical state to the next, but we just treat them as equivalent at this symbolic level. Now, the last level is the semantic level. This is the highest level where we talk about semantic states and principles of operation. So we had physical laws, we have rules, and now we have principles of operation. Semantic states are similarly defined in sets of equivalent states, of equivalent symbolic states. And the principles describe how you go from one semantic state to another semantic state. This shows you in a, a computer. At the, the top there, we have this semantic level. Now, we represent the symbols below in quotes. But how do you sort of represent a semantic state? We sort of put them in brackets. So on the left for the input state, we have 4 plus 2. But that's equivalent to a number of different symbolic states we could be in. It could be in 4 plus 2 or 3 plus 3 doesn't matter what those symbols are, they're all equivalent to the concept of 4 plus 2. And when you use that 4 plus 2 semantic state, it goes to the semantic state of 6. And that could be represented in different ways as well. It could be the number 6 or it could be written word 6. We don't care. So again, we've gone to a higher level of description, which is more easy to understand and more useful, the semantic level. The semantic level is also called the knowledge level. So, and again, we go at that at the symbolic level still there. It's not gone away. We can go from different symbolic states, but we ignore that and just say we go from the 4 plus 2 to the 6 state. So this is what computation, computational systems are. A physical system with three levels of abstraction above that physical level. Going from functional states to symbolic states with rules to semantic states with principles of operations. And computers are computational systems, as I've shown. They have these three levels of description, and the symbols can refer to things, and the symbols can be consistent. So computers are computational systems, and this is what we mean. What is a computer? It's a computational system. So why are they computational systems? As I mentioned, they have these three different levels. The functional level with the voltages and the functional specification. The symbolic level with the symbols and the rules of behavior, sort of like the code and the semantic level with the concepts and the principles. Now, the, the nice thing about this is these higher levels of description can ignore the lower level details. And you get much more value from a higher level. If I told you, you know, all the atoms in this thing were this organized, you couldn't tell me much about the thing. But if I told you a higher level description, it's more useful to you. And this is why we do the levels of abstraction. Now, computers aren't the only things that are computational systems. Of course, a calculator is almost like a computer. But even a physical calculator like this is a computational system. It's just got a different implementation. It's not implemented in terms of electronics. It's basically implemented in terms of mechanical states and mechanical configuration. But we abstract over those mechanical states to say there's a symbol. If the button's up this high or above this level, then it's a 1. Or if it's down below this level, it's a 0 or so forth. So we can implement a computational system in a mechanical system as well. And this gives us a good uh, hint that possibly we can implement the brain in a non-biological system. Because we're abstracting above that biolog biology to the functional, to the symbolic, and to the semantic levels. And again, in a, a calculator, the semantics are pretty clear. The semantics of a calculator are the number states. We don't care how the number's represented in the calculator, whether it's buttons or, number or a screen. And the principles of operations for a calculator are mathematics. The add operation, the minus operation, the multiply operation. And the symbols need to be constructed to obey those particular semantics to build a, a functional calculator. So we have lots of different computational systems, calculators, computers, and others. But the big question now is to ask, what am I? And what are you? And I want to make the claim that we're a computational system as well, and try and explain that. Now, when I'm starting here, I'm starting from certain assumptions, which you may disagree with, but these are my assumptions. My assumption is that basically we're a biological information processing system. We don't have electrons running around in our brain, in our neurons, we have ions running around doing some similar stuff. 
but basically it's a wiring system to make our information processing happen. So we're not assuming there's any sort of ghost in the machine or souls or spirits. We're saying everything about us needs to be explained in terms of this biological information processing system. And we want to try and do that now. So of course, here's a physical system, my son. We can describe him in a physical state and physical laws. But we're not interested in the whole body, we're interested in just the brain. So we can have a physical level description of the brain, its physical states and physical laws that say how those states will change. Because of course the brain operates under the physical laws, it can't break those laws. But we want to have a look inside that and say, hey, what's inside the brain? Well, there's these neuron things, like the wiring. And basically, if you don't know about it, they have connections at the end where other neurons connect to. They add up all the symbols coming in. If it goes over a certain threshold, then the neuron sends out a signal. If it doesn't, it stays pretty quiet. So this is the sort of mathematical equation on the right. But that's how neurons look like. Uh, inside our brain, there are apparently 80 billion neurons. It's down on, we used to think it was 100 billion, but they did some more studies, and we've got 20 billion less. But it doesn't make us any less smart. We can still do a lot with 80 billion. It's a complex network of these neurons in the brain. So how do we look at this in terms of computational systems? The first thing is, of course, that physical level description I mentioned. Physical states and physical laws. The brain obeys physics. It can't not obey physics. And it goes from state to state. But now when it gets interesting, we talk about the functional level description of the brain. So we're going to abstract away from those physical states and so let's look about, let's talk about the firing rate of a neuron. Not about where all the ions and atoms are inside the neuron, but let's abstract away and we can say the neuron is firing at this rate or that rate, or this rate or that rate. It's usually a low rate or a high rate. And the way the actual brain is, is configured is, is it's sort of wired. So its functional specification is sort of like the wiring of, a, of a computer circuits. But now it's the wiring of these neurons. So when we look at the brain, we can abstract over those physical states and say, this neuron here is firing or not firing. That's the input. And then the output has some sort of rule set up because of the configuration to be firing or not firing. So we're abstracting over the physical states to get a functional description in terms of firing rates of the neurons. Now, as I say, we're looking at simplified systems here. We're not going to actually look at uh, complex systems. So, um, it's more here just an input-output. We're not looking at the complexities of all the parts of the brains just yet. Input and output. So when we're in a particular input state, we go to an output state. Um, that's the symbolic, oh sorry, now look at the symbolic level description. The symbolic level abstracts against, above those firing rates. So we don't care whether the firing rate is 10 firings per second or 5 firings per second. If it's low, that's considered a zero. Now if it's very high firing rate, 20, 30, 50, 100 firings per second, then we consider it a one. So we've got this on and off switch again, sort of like a bit. But of course, neurons aren't bits. They're very unreliable, and they tend to work in collections. But for our abstraction here, just think of them as a single bit in the brain. So the brain is configured to go from symbolic state to symbolic state. One neuron turns on, the other one turns off because of their connections. We can ignore the details of all the firing and just think about these symbolic states, the higher level description. So what about the semantic level? Well, now we can abstract again over those symbolic states and say, hey, down the bottom here we have some inputs coming into the computer. Maybe the input is something like you see a cat or you hear a cat or you read the word cat. You know, lots of inputs, lots of bits are firing in your brain when you see a cat. That's the symbolic level, seeing a cat. But up the top there, we now have this semantic state. Oh, we're seeing a cat. We don't care whether it's this cat or that cat or how we see the cat. Our brain says we'll operate the same way no matter what the different symbols are. And what we're going to do in this simple case is announce the cat. Hey, there's the cat. But we also don't mind how we announce the cat. We could say cat, or we could write cat, or we could shout cat. Again, input goes to output. We don't care how the symbols work as long as it is consistent with this semantic level. That's the semantic level description of how the brain works. See a cat, you announce a cat. Just to make it clear, on the left is our input, on the right is our output. So we see this cat, we shout cat. 
But hey, it could be a different cat. It's a sa different symbol, but the same semantics to us in our operation is that it's just a cat, so we'll say cat. And of course, you could say cat in sign language rather than saying cat. It doesn't matter, these different symbolic operations are still equivalent enough we're announcing there's a cat. And it could be a whole lot of different cats, and we could say things in different ways and so forth. So the semantic level describes this higher level. You're seeing this concept of a cat and you're reacting to it in a certain way. So brains are computational systems. They have those three levels of descriptions we talked about uh, before, the symbolic and so forth. The functional level, the symbolic level, and the semantic level. And again, these higher levels of abstractions are very useful. Another example, you see a fire. Of course, your action may be, scream out, fire. But your conceptual or semantic level could be, if we see danger, then sort of panic or do something like that. So it doesn't matter to us whether we see the smoke, we still may shout fire. And it doesn't matter whether we see, we shout fire or we run away. Okay, we're doing something equivalent action or, 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 or dial 911. Again, at the semantic level, the behavior is described as you see a fire or you hear fire or whatever fire, you panic or do something. So that's the semantic level description of the brain. Now, if we say brain is a computational system, and I hope you're sort of convinced a bit there, the key thing to note here is that it explains everything, but it also explains nothing. What does it explain? Well, it explains what type of system the brain is. It's a computational system. That's really important. It explains how the human behavior works. We have these different levels which abstract over each other. And it provides an operational definition of meaning. What is the meaning of the cat? It's all these different symbolic behaviors which are equivalent to that. We're abstracting over the set of symbols. That's very important. Things it doesn't explain, it doesn't tell us the complete wiring of the brain. We're still working that out, trying to understand the functional architecture of the brain. And it doesn't explain how brains learn, which is a very important thing we'll see soon. Now, calculators don't learn, but brains do learn. So let's talk a bit about now how we could maybe implement a mind, which is the running program of a brain. And there are two different approaches. There's the classical approach, the old-fashioned approach, which was classical AI. You may have heard of expert systems. These were symbol systems. They worked with symbols like cat and dog and produced responses like say hello or whatever. And there are these new connectionist ones or neural network approaches. These were different. They were sort of lower level. I want to explain how they differ in terms of this computational model. So first of all, we said that a classical digital computer and a brain are both computational systems. They both have three different levels, symbolic and semantic. They're similar in that way. But how are they different, a classical digital computer? The difference is this. When we program a classical digital computer, we program at the symbolic level. So the computer wiring is set up for us, and we program by saying, here comes the, symbolic, the symbols and the rules which will say how those symbols change, which is your code. But the mind doesn't have a program at the symbol level. It's only programmed at the functional level, the wiring that the genes specify. So where do the symbols come from in the brain? They're actually learned. These symbols and the rules which say how they move from one to the other, your behavior, actually emerges as you learn and watch the environment. And the semantics emerge as well. So the symbols emerge and the semantics emerge. This raises a big question for me. Are minds Turing equivalent? We have a look on the left-hand side. Uh, classical AI, the symbols there will match the symbols in a Turing machine. Yes, it's like a Turing machine. But on the right-hand side, when we start off with a mind, there are no symbols. And these symbols emerge and they're continuously changing. And the rules are emerging and changing. But a Turing machine says we have these particular symbols and these rules. I claim that's not really a Turing machine equivalent because it's defining and emerging symbols rather than having them specified. But how do we actually, or um, well, the similarities now between a neural network type solution, a connectionist AI, and the mind. When we set up neural networks with AWS or your own programming, you're basically specifying the functional level, how these artificial neurons are connected 
and then it tries to learn. So it learns symbols. I can recognize a cat and say cat. So it's very similar to the mind, specified at the functional level. Now, when we're trying to implement one of these artificial neural networks at the functional level, how can we implement it? Well, we could make our own neurons, but we tend to like to use a classical computer to implement a neural network and run it. How does that work? This shows you how what actually happens here. What actually happens, we use a classical computer program, a symbolic system, so you write some code, but the code you write, the symbols in your program, are not equivalent to the symbols in the mind or the connectionist system. The symbols you use in your program match the functional level of the uh, connectionist system. So you're using your symbols to say, specify the firing rate of the neurons, not the symbols themselves. So we're using symbols at a different level. That's why they're not equivalent. So we can implement these connectionist systems in classical AI symbol systems, but we're implementing them by implementing their functional level. OK, so this is what the conclusion of my sort of research was, my PhD and so forth. There are two different types of computation. There's what I call discrete computation. This is where you specify in your program everything up to the symbol level. So you write the program in terms of symbols to define some semantic level. You're writing some calculator code to make a calculator implement mathematics. Discrete because the rules are chunky. If this, then that. The symbols are precise and static. I call it discrete computation. The brain, however, as I'm trying to imply to you here, is different. I call it continuous computation. Because again, it's only specified at the physical and the functional level. The symbols and the semantics emerge as a result of learning. And I'm trying to show you there the wiggly symbols rather than square boxes, preset values, the symbols emerge, and, and your definition or understanding or operational behavior with regards to cats change as you learn about cats and you see more cats. Your brain always changes, and the, phys and the symbols and the rules are in continuous dynamic flux and evolving continuously. So continuous computational systems. So there we go. Um, I hope I've shown you or given you an idea that I'm a computer, a computational system, and you are too. But to be more precise about this, um, I'm a continuous computational system, and you are too. So we're not like a classical computer program with symbols. We're like a, computa a, a continuous computational system with emerging symbols and emerging rules and emerging semantics. And of course, the learning has to be good to ensure we actually emerge and learn things properly. OK. so. Um, that leads us to the big question now, what is I? And this is going to get some audience participation in this one. So what is I? Well, what are we? There's a lot of things that people talk about when they talk about I. They talk about um, awareness, self-awareness, free will, qualia. If you don't know what that means, we'll explain it in a second. And consciousness, of course. These are the big questions. The consciousness one is called a CLM. Career limiting move. If you start to researching consciousness, then your chances of success and getting a good promotion and so forth are very low. Although it's becoming more popular these days, people are doing a lot of research in it. So, what do all these mean, in particular with regards to computational systems? The first one, awareness, I think is quite easy if you think about it computationally. If you're aware of something, say in your environment, it basically means you show consistent and appropriate behavior with respect to perceptions of it. So for example, if I'm aware of this microphone, I know not to touch it, and I know if I need to touch it, my symbols are working properly in a nice, semantically consistent way. But if I don't, aren't aware of that microphone and I bump it, I haven't been aware of it. My system symbols and so forth wasn't aware of that. So my behavior to it wasn't appropriate or, or successful in terms of what I was doing. Similar with um, seeing objects, other objects in the world. So awareness is about really having some computational semantics which are appropriate for the things you're trying to be aware of. Are these three levels there? Now there's a classic example of where this goes wrong. There's a famous book in research. It says, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. He had a brain disorder and he thought his wife's head was a hat and was trying to put it on. Very sad, of course. 
But I hope you see what this means. It means it hasn't got the right symbols and the right semantics for the hat, so the behavior is inappropriate. So it's failed. So it hasn't really got this awareness of a hat for what it really is. It hasn't got the computational levels set up and working correctly. True story, you can read about that, a book by Oliver, Oliver, Oliver Sacks. What about self-awareness? Well, it's the same sort of thing, but as you go through life, of course, you see your body with you, it's all around there, and you start to behave consistently with regards to your body. So you're aware of yourself being with you all the time. Self-awareness is consistent and appropriate behavior with respect to internal and external perceptions of yourself. So I see this thing here, and I'm set up correctly, I've learned correctly, this is my hand, it's not someone else's hand, right? And I know I can control it and do things with it. As I mentioned here, it's not just external stuff. When you talk externally, you can hear yourself, but also we have this loop going on in our head where we can actually hear ourselves. We can talk internally, our mental dialogue. This is an example of a computational system as well. Are you responding to your thoughts appropriately with new thoughts and so forth? So again, computational awareness of your environment and awareness of yourself, self-awareness. I think they're not too hard. When it gets more difficult, or a bit more difficult, is free will. Okay, so everyone says, what is free will and whatever, and they have all these ideas, and we need some soul or spirit to make us be able to make decisions. When I come down to it, I think it's pretty easy. What is free will? Free will is making decisions and taking actions based upon your current inputs and your past experience. Okay, what else could it be? All right, so you're making a decision. You ask me now, what do you want for lunch, lamb or fish? Something's happening in my brain based upon the inputs you gave me and the experience I have, some process is going along to actually produce a result, I want fish. Okay, that's what free will is. We're making again, it's a mechanical, biological machine making a decision. Nothing fancy there. Now it does mean somewhat that we're deterministic, which people all don't feel, well, I can't make my own decisions. Well, how do you make your decisions? You make them based on current inputs and your past experience. What else could you want? And don't worry, even though it is deterministic, there's lots of non-linearity in the system, lots of noise and quantum indeterminacy, you could never predict what someone's going to say or do at that sort of level. So free will, I think, is also not difficult. Where things get very difficult is when we talk about qualia. I don't know if you've heard about qualia. But it's the philosophical, content, uh, so philosophical concept of what's it like to. So we can behave consistently with respect to things. But there's a certain difference when you feel what it's like to do something or see something. That's what we want to talk about now. We're going to talk about what's it like to feel pain? What's it like to see? And what's it like to see red? And we'll try and see, no pun intended, whether these things relate to the computational approach we've looked at for the human mind. So this is where we have to ask the, audio, the controller to please lock the doors. We can do some experiment with pain. And we ask, uh, any, are there any volunteers here who want to experience some pain? No volunteers, so everyone can do it. All right. So I promise some pain. So get ready. What I want you to do, please, get your arms all limbered up. Get your arms free. Put your phones down. I want you to pinch yourself on your arm somewhere. Pinch very hard, not too hard, don't make some damage, but so you can feel it. See that word there? Feel it. Okay, so you pinched your arm. What happened then? The question is, where is the pain? You felt something, pain, but where is the pain? And most of the time you say, oh yeah, it's in my arm. I can feel me pinching there. But remember what's happening here. All that's happening is there's a detector there which is sending an electrical signal up to your brain. So when it gets to your brain, it's just a on or off. There's no pain in that signal. So where does the pain come from? It's not in your arm. The pain is in your mind. Your mind is constructing this pain. For a good reason, of course, because maybe you've got a, a knife on your arm or you're pinching too hard or so forth and wants to stop you. But you're feeling this pain. So pain is constructed in the mind. Quite interesting to think about. All right, another expect, uh, experiment. What does it feel like to see red? Or what does red feel like? So the question here is to look at something red. 
don't know if you can see something red around. Anyone got some red on? If not, we can look at this. So look at this red dot and think, what does it feel? It feels like something to look at red, doesn't it? It feels like red. What does that mean? Remember, what's happening here, it's just electrical signals in your brain. But somehow your brain is constructing this thing that it feels like red. This is a big puzzle. This is the qualia puzzle. What does it mean to feel like or to see red? Now, lots of answers, possible answers to this, but uh, another thing here, and my hypothesis is when you're sitting back and you're looking at red, what you're actually doing is behaving in a way consistent with all the states of different reds. And you're giving that a label. Doesn't matter whether it's light red or dark red or this shade of red. Your semantics are, this is red. So you're identifying it as red, and you're saying, I'm feeling red when I'm looking at that. Again, it comes to this computational approach to different levels up to semantics. It doesn't matter what the symbol is, different types of red, the semantics, it's red. And you're responding to the fact, yes, I'm seeing red. It's a red thing, and it feels like red. Not totally convincing that. I don't know if you don't believe me on that. I'm not totally convinced yet, but that's the, the feeling I have. It gets a bit weirder. What about black? When you close, when you um, don't see anything, it looks black. But why does it look, why does it feel black? Why couldn't it be white? You know, what, what defines something as white? Or you say, well, it's because there's lots of light. But we're, we're looking at it, we see it's white, but what, why couldn't we see it as black? It's almost arbitrary whether you have white or black when we feel it to be white or black. But of course, we need something to be able to distinguish them, so these are what we've basically got. I think you could swap them around and everything would still work fine. It would be a sort of negative color system rather than a positive color system. So this brings us to the last little experiment, what it feels like to see. And this experiment is uh, important. Please close your eyes. Everyone closing their eyes. And hopefully you can't see anything. It's pretty dark, although I may, may see some white spots and so forth. And at the count of three, I want you to open your eyes. One, two, three. Now you're seeing here, right? You're experiencing, you can feel what it looks like to see. Now the really important point here is your behavior could be consistent with seeing. I could notice this microphone's here and, and, and act appropriately. But it's almost like a step up to say, yes, I'm behaving consistently, but it actually feels like something to see. And that's the tricky point about this qualia. It feels more like, more than just behaving consistently. Of course, when you think about it, you go from black to seeing something. Really, you know about what happens in there? We ask the question, what does it mean to see? Everyone will give you a description of, yes, we have the, the, the image coming through the, op, the, um, the lenses and the eyes. It's sort of inverted. It goes into the back of the brain. That's just like the wire coming up your arm. It's not really important because at the end, it's just electrical signals at the back of your brain. How does your brain turn those electrical signals into this experience that I feel like I'm seeing things? It's more than just behaving consistently. So we have this. But how do we get the fact that, yes, I'm seeing something? Similarly, we can look at bats. Bats are a bit different. Of course, they don't look with uh, normal sight. They use echolocation. So what's it like to see as a bat? We don't really know. Is it like that? Or do they see it more like, we'd guess, you know, closer things are brighter? A different way of perceiving the world. What does it feel like to be a bat is a question that philosophers of, often ask. Okay, the last one here is tricky, it's consciousness, and I'm running out of time. Um, we've mentioned all these things, so consciousness is often involved with all of these, but there's something more than just behaving consistently. Um, people suggest that consciousness could live in the microtubules of the neurons, these very small things inside the neurons. I think that's just putting the problem down a level. Others think that it could be due to with quantum mechanics. We need quantum mechanics to be conscious. Um, I think that's just, again, putting the issue away. We know we're a biological system. The consciousness didn't come in there because of quantum mechanics. But it came through evolution. And the last one says, well, maybe the world consists of space and time. Yes, we agree. Energy and matter. Yes, that's the universe. But now maybe there's a third thing called consciousness. And a lot of physicists now are believing this because they couldn't see other ways of explaining consciousness. 
But again, to me, when I look at the evolution of the species, I think, where did consciousness come in? It wasn't some time that the universe jumped into our head and made us conscious. It's more about the physical architecture and function of the brain. So here's, I put here, a computational theory of consciousness. Basically, it's got to do with self-awareness. So you act consistently with regards to your states, like seeing red or seeing or pain. Uh, I think you can get most of it out of that, but maybe not all. The last thing here to look at is uh, how do we make robots conscious? That's the whole idea. We want to make AI systems. We can make computational AI systems. But how can we make a robot that actually has consciousness? You know, these are robots with cameras, like eyes. They can see and behave consistently, but do they actually feel like they're looking, as we do? Um, so here's our robot. We can make that robot work well when it turns its cameras on. It can avoid the cars and this sort of stuff. But will the robot say that it actually can feel that it's seeing things? How can we make that actually happen? And again, I think basically we use this computational theory. We design our robots not just to behave consistently with regards to the inputs and so forth, but to be self-aware of the fact that they are seeing. They can see red and they can feel pain. And then our behavior becomes consistent with us actually feeling like we're seeing. So I say, yes, I can see. I can see things. I can feel it. So basically, again, taking the computational approach. But I won't go into that. I haven't got time. That's about um, all there. I'll leave a second or two for, um, I'll just jump through this because I haven't got time to do that. Questions. Just to summarize, I didn't want to do this. Um, sorry. To summarize what we've seen, and maybe you agree or don't agree, I've explained what a computational system is, a system that allows three levels of description, has symbols that represent things, and maintains semantics under transformations. I've talked about von Neumann computers are discrete computational systems, and the brain and connection of systems are more like continuous computational systems. Um, I've talked that being a computational system allows us to operationalize, explain things like awareness, self-awareness, and possibly qualia and consciousness as this consistent level of behavior. But importantly, if any of you are working in robotics or AI, the real question is, how can we make robots truly human-like? We'll need to make them computational systems, but also aware, self-aware, and have feelings and consciousness. So we can already make lots of robots that are very smart and can do things. But can we make robots that actually feel pain? Maybe that's useful in an evolutionary approach or a programming approach, so it's aware of the fact that it's got a knife in its leg or something like this. Can we make robots that can actually see and be aware of seeing, not just behave consistently with what it means to see? And I had a bit of trouble finding an image, but can we make robots that are happy and joyful? Okay? Not many robot photos show them being happy. We haven't tried to make them feel like they're happy. So all right, that's about all there. So I have uh, any questions or quick questions? A lot of stuff, but uh, hopefully it provided some explanation of what it means to see and to be computational. Yep. OK, first question. Uh, so just on your first point, um, you said that you there might be an advantage for having a AI system actually feel consciousness, mm. right? But is there really any advantage to doing that? Like, Very good question. Very good question. Is there any advantage to actually feeling something rather than just behaving consistently? You know, we could, if someone puts a knife in our leg, we could behave consistently and pull it out and not even be aware of it. In fact, when you're sleepwalking, People sleepwalk and they do eating and everything when they're asleep. So they're not conscious, but they're doing all, they're behaving consistently. So it's a really good question. And I believe there must be some evolutionary advantage to know you're in, in pain, maybe even to learn from that experience. So it's not just behaving consistently. You're aware of the fact, yes, that was pain. Maybe I can change my behavior and so forth. So evolutionary, I think, why are they here? And probably because it makes us a fitter species to survive. I think the only difference you'd see is that um, the AI system would write a Wikipedia page about qualia. Mm. I think that's the only difference that we'd see, provided that it didn't have That could be knowledge. true, but, but there, we have a lot of feelings. 
You know, we feel what it's like to see. We feel what it's, what it's like to be read. We feel pain. Why not? If we didn't feel pain, we could just do the stuff without feeling it. Would that be okay? I think there's something to that feeling pain. You really learn something from it. As I say, it's more like it's a higher level abstraction. It doesn't matter what sort of pain it is. We're just learning to respond to pain. But it's an open question. I'm just going to add that we are moving into lunch. So sure. we're finished. we have plenty of time for questions. I think I'm going to trespass on Dr. Ashley's time here and ask you to stay. But if you do, sure. did want to make a move and grab your lunch now, you'd be very welcome to do so. Um, I see we have a question here. Thank you. Just quickly, top-down versus bottom-up AI, and how's the development going along that, as well as yeah. with artificial intelligence? So, so top-down is probably that symbolic approach, yes. right? And I think it suffers from it's fragile. You can write some rules, but they don't actually work in every case, so it, it breaks and doesn't work properly. That's what we found with expert systems. Whereas bottom-up, when things emerge, they tend to be more stable and they can handle things which aren't exactly what you predicted. So bottom-up is definitely the way to go. And we see all the, the stuff we're seeing from AWS and in the, in the phones have neural networks now. It's uh, emergent and learning these things. What about teaching an artificial intelligent being ethics and morals? This is where it comes back to, I think, a bit more about language and words and what do they mean and how, what consequences they have. You know, language is just behavior. So I can say I'm moral and I can say it a hundred times. It doesn't mean I'm going to behave morally, right? It doesn't control our behavior. Language is just a behavior. So. But the co correlationship between that language and the behavior and the consistency between the two. Sh sure, it, it, but it doesn't have to exist. There are many criminals who think of themselves as good people and honest and they go and commit crimes. Yeah. So, so it doesn't, uh, we're not, we're not driven by our logic. We're driven by the behavior we learn and experience. And I missed a section there on describing complex behavior. Just briefly, I believe we actually learn by just seeing patterns and replaying those patterns using very complex hierarchical association engine, as I call it. So we're just behaving what we've seen and we replay those behaviors over and over. And we, you know, doing anything is basically just replaying behaviors in certain contexts. So language is that. You know, I learn to say things and I... Last question, Wait. neurodiverse individuals. Well, How out of my scope there, in? out of my scope. We've all got different brains with different you know, functions in these different areas and uh, different abilities to abstract and different learning rates. So there's a wide variation. But I would call them all computational systems, so... I'm sorry. Hey, um, really good talk. Thank you. I. I agree with you. I think there's probably a lot of scientific benefit to be gained by potentially giving consciousness and certain other sort of like metaphysical abilities for robots to be able to, to do. But in the scientific community, we're typically bounded by sets of rules of what we, not just what we can do, but what we should do. So how do you feel, you know, what the ethical impl implications might be of giving the robot the ability to feel pain? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, if you think of us as just machines experiencing pain, we're just machines experiencing pain. Robots are just machines experiencing pain. We know, it, we've made a guess that it's biologically or evolutionary advantage to feel pain. If we give them an ability, then we put pain on them. It's the same as putting pain on a person. So you have to take a consideration of that. Because um, it's really innate. That feeling of pain is so deep and so strong in your system that it's sort of a part of you. So if you make pain or hurt a robot, then the same sort of thing. So you'd be responsible for it, I guess. Mm. Lots of good questions. Thank you. I was wondering uh, what your feedback would be on the um, call out that the Google AI mm. may or may not be Sentinel. Yeah, sure. So what are your thoughts on that? So I don't know anything about the project particularly, that one they were talking about. But it's mainly what they're doing, they're training these uh, systems on large amounts of text to respond with text. So they, get, they learn lots of context, which is what I was going to explain in the extra slides there. Your cortex is basically a hierarchical context engine. So it learns if you're in this context, in this context, in this state, you say this. And this is what they did. They put lots of training on if you see this sentence, you say this sentence. And you have huge millions and millions of training. But the problem there again is they're working at that symbolic level. All right? The, the saving grace is they don't have if-then rules. 
there's statistics between the symbols. If you see this symbol, then statistically, this one's more likely than this one. So they're sort of halfway between the continuous and the discrete. They're sort of halfway there. The symbols are fixed, but their um, rules are sort of continuous and change with learning. So whether it's conscious or not, again, I guess we'd come back to consciousness again is different than this being computational. I think it would be a computational system. It understands when you say it's raining, oh yes, I'll take my umbrella. So it's behaving consistently at the symbolic level. So it understands the semantics of raining and umbrella. But the issue there, and this is just reminding me, I had an extra slide, is that AI system is not grounded. And what I mean by grounded is we actually experience rain and see rain. It's just getting text in and text out. So it really doesn't know what rain is. It's just saying what it needs to say to respond correctly to that rain. So I think it understands rain in its concept of rain, defined by its semantics and symbols, but it has, it's not grounded like a real robot would be and can experience rain. So I think they're computational, but I wouldn't go so far as to say they're aware or self-aware or conscious. It's just this computation, the semantics are there because we've learned so much, but I wouldn't call it sentient. Are you comfortable for some more questions? I'm happy to if you, people have some questions. Um, with the different levels of um, abstraction of um, physical, functional, et cetera, there, do, do you think the different levels have any irreducible emergent properties or they're just useful abstractions at each level? Mm, I'm not really sure. I don't have an answer to that. Um, irreducible properties. Uh, now, we know the symbolic level needs to represent. Uh, it's, it's just the abstraction is so important. I think that's the most important aspect of this. And I sort of alluded to it. You know, I had a, a question uh, I use, when I'm trying to explain abstraction to people, how useful it is. If I told you there are 10 billion atoms here, and this is how they're all configured, I gave you the exact location, and I said, that's the car I want. Go and buy it. You wouldn't even be able to tell me what color the car is, let alone what model and what engine. So although you have all the detail of the physical system, every little specific detail, you're losing what you get at the higher level. So ignoring the detail can actually be more useful than the lower level. So that's what we get from the abstractions. Having that symbolic level says we can ignore the functional states. And writing the symbols so we get uh, uh, consistent semantics is the benefit. But I don't know of any irreducible properties of these different levels particularly. So it's a limitation of like the human mind or the processing as opposed to a reality itself, it's... Yeah, it's a human, the human brain is learning symbols and learning semantics, and it's wired at a, at a neural level so that it eventually learns something which is consistent and it allows us to survive in the world. You know, you could be programmed wrong, so you then come out with wrong semantics and you're bumping into everything and you can't talk and you get your wife and try to put her on your head. That wouldn't work, but luckily our learning tends to end us up with a semantic system that is useful. That's what evolution has given us. And that's what AI is trying to do, build systems that learn from experiences and become useful. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Happy thank to you. answer any other questions if you want, but thank you, Hannah. Great talk. Thank you so much.